So just to let you know a little bit about the intention of this masterclass, our intention is really to showcase chemistry to everyone, uh, not only as a subject that you can study in university, but really as a subject that bridges between different disciplines, you know, between physics, materials, biology, and as you hear today also, um, uh, you know, it plays important roles in history. It's also a gateway to understanding our world and chemistry is a gateway for you to give back to the world. So uh, very much so you see examples where people can start their own companies based on inventions or um, using chemistry. So here we are showing you chemistry at its finest from the past, the present to the future, hopefully where you can participate in. Um, so with all good science, it always comes, uh, it always starts with a good question. And so we've really asked you for your big questions and you've really responded in masses. So thank you very much for that. I'm collated all your questions and you can see here, it's a word, a word, a word map. And the bigger the writing, obviously the bigger, uh, the more the word was used. And I can see that from looking at this, everyone is very much looking forward to understanding how chemistry can be used in the future to help, to help us think and change the world. Uh, so these are all fantastic responses. And I've called it, I've broken this down into categories to help us better understand what your interests are. So we had some fantastic questions um, to do with, you know, the bigger picture, where, where, where did we come from where we're heading and then also how can we apply the chemistry we have now to improving our world um, reversing climate change things like this and so this is what this morning will be about uh, we have professor Hesok Chang who will be telling us about some you know some historic moments in chemistry that has led to today and then I'm with you right now and I will be telling you about how um, chemistry today is really being applied leading on from what uh, professor Chang has said to to solving some of these problems aiding by Dr. Svetlana menken Bacho, who is um, in Professor Claire Gray's group, in the batteries group. Uh, so we'll be answering these parts of the questions as much as possible, of course, not every single question, because there's just not enough time. And this afternoon, Dr. Alex Force will be telling you, Fawcett will be telling you about um, how we can make drugs. And then Dr. Adam Clancy will be telling about how to make nanoparticles. So that should be loads of fun. Now there's loads of people who ask other questions about how, you know, certain bondings work, how, how certain uh, mechanisms work, which were fantastic. But uh, I think there'll be, fat, there'll be lots of resources that would be able to help you uh, when you start learning chemistry as a degree and they'll be able to ask you questions better so we'll leave that for that and then there are other questions not related to these topics which are also fantastic and we love reading about them um, again we won't have time to, to get to those because we just want to um, answer as much of uh, uh, the majority of uh, your questions as possible so um, without further ado, I'm going to start by um, really looking at the bigger picture first. I think this is a great way to start. Some of your questions include, you know, what discoveries in chemistry do you think had the biggest impact on our lives today? And really the, the perfect person to answer this question, uh, or at least from, uh, start the discussion is Professor Hazap Chang. He's a Hans Rosling Professor of History and Philosophy of Science. This is a, a subject in, in Cambridge that you can take as a natural science um, students in the second year and so it leads very naturally from from any kind of um, science subjects that you take uh, so I'll give the floor now to Professor Chang to tell us about um, the history. Thank you very much Dr. Chang and um, let me share my screen now to show you some slides I prepared. Good morning everyone. So my brief here is to take the long historical view on the role of chemistry through the centuries. And I thought I would start with medicine, which I know a lot of you are quite interested in. So I'm gonna start with a story that comes down in my own family back in South Korea. This is about how my uncle, my father's elder brother was badly injured in the Korean war in the beginning phase back in 1951 family got word that he was laid up in a military hospital. He's okay, but he was going to die because his wounds had gone septic. Now, penicillin was available, but very hard to get. And the only thing that they could do was to go to the black market, buy some penicillin and bring it to my uncle. So my father was charged with somehow coming up with the money 
to go to the black market and he appealed to his grandfather who was a big farmer who had stashed away sacks of rice um, during the war. So my father brought these sacks of rice to the market, got some cash, bought some penicillin, saved my uncle. And that uncle is 93 years old today and he's still alive and well, thanks to chemistry. Now, um, long before penicillin, um, of course, chemists were trying to do something about it. There's rife diseases everywhere that humanity had been suffering from. Um, and, you know, today we're worrying about viruses, but before antibiotics, it, it was the bacterial infections killing everybody off. You all know probably about the Black Death, which wiped out a whole third of the population of Europe in the medieval times. And there was also the case of syphilis, the terrible sexually transmitted disease that so many people had. And you may also know that early chemists used mercury to try to treat syphilis. And there was the infamous question, is the disease worse than the cure? Would, would you rather die from mercury poisoning or from your tertiary syphilis? And a better kind of chemotherapy, as they called, only came around the year 1900, the beginning of the 20th century. And we owe a great deal to this man, Paul Ehrlich in Germany. Um, who invented this thing that was marketed under the name Salvarsan, which was a much safer treatment for syphilis. Now, how he came to this is very interesting. I mean, penicillin, right, the mold and everything came from biology. Salvarsan came from pure chemistry. So Ehrlich was a specialist in the chemistry of dyes, right? And he had done this work to stay in biological tissue to right, be able to see them better under the microscope. And when the tuberculosis bacteria was discovered, he immediately used this thing called methylene blue to stain it in the picture you see. And through the course of this work, Ehrlich got this idea. Right, so there are these chemicals that selectively bind with these disease-causing cells, what if we could make some toxic ones that would target these bacteria and kill them? So that was the idea of the magic bullet that we still talk about these days. Ehrlich got the idea, to cut a long story short, that he could use organic arsenic compounds to target the syphilis bacteria and with a young Japanese visiting scholar called um, Sahachiro Hata in Berlin, they worked together trying every damned arsenic compound they could find and testing it to see if it was good for treating syphilis. And they found uh, finally this thing they call compound number 606, <laughs> which um, was quite effective. And later on, penicillin would come in as the much more effective cure. But Ehrlich's work on Salvarsan uh, was the beginning of the kind of pharmaceutical industry that, that we have today. Now, a different kind of story comes also out of Germany around the same time. Uh, and it's the story of this man, Fritz Haber was very famous for coming up with the industrial process for synthesizing ammonia on a large scale. Now, why do we care about ammonia? Because it's a very important precursor material for manufacturing both fertilizers and explosives. So if you want a strong country who can feed its people and fight its enemies, you want to be able to make ammonia. Now, ammonia, as you all know, is a very simple molecule, right? NH3, but it's really difficult to manufacture. So traditionally, ammonia was got from organic materials, right? But 
people wanted to be able to make it industrially. And the idea is nice and simple, right? You get some nitrogen gas, you get some hydrogen gas, make them combine, but they don't want to combine. So how do you do it? And this is what Haber figured out. Um, what he came up with was a process that was eventually called the Haber Bosch process because he had a collaborator called Carl Bosch, a nephew, by the way, of, of the man who founded the Bosch company who, that manufactures uh, electrical appliances today. Anyway, Haber came up with this idea of using a catalyst, initially iron, at a high temperature to make encourage nitrogen and hydrogen gases to combine. And later, he also added the idea of doing it under high pressure, 200 atmospheres initially used, and using various um, kinds of catalysts. So this work won Haber the Nobel Prize in 1918, which he couldn't receive at the time because it was in the middle of the First World War, and he got it the next year. But this was a very controversial decision. You might wonder why he looks like he done some really good chemistry that was also very useful. The controversy was because Haber was considered by many other people as a war criminal, because Haber had led the German effort in the First World War in chemical warfare, and he personally supervised the very first major chemical attack using chlorine gas uh, in the fields of Ypres in Belgium. So he was infamous and the Western powers wanted him tried as a war criminal and he escaped that, but people were very upset about him being given the Nobel Prize. Now, Haber said he was fully justified, you know, you're fighting a war. What difference does it make if you're killed by a shrapnel wound or you're killed by chlorine gas. And I said, a weapon is a weapon. I'm a patriot. I want to help Germany win. And this was the way to do it. He loved Germany, but did Germany love him back? Not exactly, because Haber was Jewish. And um, he just couldn't very well stay when the Nazis came into power in the 1930s. And um, he fled spent a little bit of time in Cambridge, actually, had a mixed reception. Some people really never forgave him for his work on chemical warfare. So he went on to Palestine, which is now Israel, but um, died on the way in Switzerland. So very tragic end of his life. But one thing he tried to do uh, before uh, the Nazis came into power was to save the German economy in the disaster that it was after the First World War. So he said, oh, you know what? There's gold in seawater. And if we can figure out how to economically extract it, we could really save the German economy. And was he just crazy about that? No, not really, because there is gold in seawater. You just have to learn how to extract it economically. And Haber thought he had a method using electrochemistry, because that was another uh, line of his research. And basically, right, uh, metal ions exist uh, uh, in solution, and you can pick them up because they're, they're positive ions, right? Uh, so they will come to the negative electrode um, in basic electrochemical processes. But it's a complicated thing because there's a lot else in seawater too, and you have to separate out the gold and there isn't enough of it to make this whole thing worthwhile. But maybe somebody will figure out a better process and we will be all getting our gold from the sea one day, maybe. This leads me to the third story I wanna tell you briefly today, which is about electrochemistry. Where did that all come from? And that brings us a whole hundred years back in history with this guy, Alessandro Volta in Northern Italy, who invented the first battery, which they called the voltaic pile. Why a pile? Because the shape of it was this pile of what 
pieces of two different metals and wet pieces of paper. So he piled up silver, zinc, and then wet paper, soaked in even just plain water, later salt water, and repeat. And this thing is a battery, right? Voltaire could shock himself by touching the top and the bottom of this pile. Really easy to make, right? In fact, the first uh, announcement of Voltaire's battery was not made in a scientific paper. It came out in a daily newspaper in London. It, the news was leaked, we would now say, before Voltaire's scientific paper had a chance to be published. And there's a little article reporting on someone doing a demonstration of it at, at the Royal Institution, which was brand new then. And this little part describes that's the whole description of how to make Volta's battery. Really simple to make. And people in fact made it from just reading the newspaper article. But it was really hard to understand why and how this would produce electricity. Now you, you have to remember, this was a whole century before the electron was discovered. So Anyway, you look at it, it wasn't going to be easy for them to understand how anything like this works. Volta's own idea was that when two metals come into contact, electricity flows in one direction. And this is the very title of his actual paper. It was called the, On the Electricity Excited by the Mere Contact of Conducting Substances of Different Kinds. And why do you have the wet stuff? He thought that would just conduct the electricity generated by the metallic pairs. So that's his picture, right? Electricity generated here goes through the wet stuff and then gets added to the electricity generated by the next pair and so on. Now, many other people said, no, that doesn't make any sense. We think it's all to do with the chemistry that happens between the wet stuff and one of the metals, zinc in this case, which is more reactive. And why do we have the other metal there? Silver, copper, something. Well, that's just to conduct the electricity produced by the chemical reaction. And they argued and argued and argued about this for the entire 19th century. Um, I'm in fact writing a whole book about this uh, long history of the voltaic controversy. Now, I can't tell you all about that right now, but what I will tell you is this. You may wonder, why was it so hard to understand? We now understand it really completely, right? So if you're doing chemistry A level, you surely have seen a picture like this uh, of the Daniel cell, right? Um, so on each side, there's a redox reaction going on, zinc and copper, which one is stronger, and it'll drive the electricity in that way. So there's another configuration here. Um, now, that of course makes sense, but the problem is that the voltaic cell is not the Daniel cell. In Volta's battery, there's only one electrolyte, not two. And it's not an electrolyte that contains the ion of the two metals involved. So this doesn't explain that. And nor does it explain this, which is your normal battery, right? One of these things that we all use. That's also not configured like the Daniel cell. In fact, it's really quite difficult to understand precisely what goes on in your normal AA battery. So that's a long story which I can just introduce to you today. But I, before I leave the battery, I should mention, I mean, just how important the battery was. Not only could you just amuse yourself by giving yourself electric shocks, which Volta did, um, immediately after the battery was made, they could do a lot of really interesting scientific things like electrolysis, like, passing a current through a wire and, and discovering that if it affected the magnetic needle and so on and so on. And the very concept of voltage, current, resistance, energy conservation, all these things were stimulated by people working with batteries and the circuits that they could make with, uh, uh, with the battery.
and lots of practical applications, of course, came. And the most important thing that people don't think about is the telegraph, right? The telegraph network, which in the 19th century really enabled things like the British Empire, uh, they were all powered by these little batteries because, I mean, we just think of a battery today as something you charge by plugging into the wall, but back in this time, there, there are no generators, no power plants, all the power originated from these primary batteries. Now, um, I said that one of the first things that happened when the battery was invented was electrolysis. And the very first electrolysis made was of water, breaking down water into hydrogen and oxygen, which hadn't been done, right? So that leads me to the final story, uh, which is about the discovery of oxygen and the composition of water, which we credit to French chemist Lavoisier shown here. And you know, before Lavoisier, everybody thought water was an element, couldn't be broken down into anything else. Lavoisier said, no, it's made up of oxygen and hydrogen, eventually convinced everybody. But what, so something that he could never do was cleanly decompose water into hydrogen and oxygen. That was only done through electrolysis after the invention of the battery. Now, we say Lavoisier was the discoverer of oxygen, but well, that's a complicated, complicated story, right? I don't know if, you, if any of you out there listening are coming from Leeds. Uh, if you go to Leeds, get out of the train station, there's a little known church called the Mill Hill Chapel on which you'll find this blue plaque, which claims that Joseph Priestley, who was the minister there, was the discoverer of oxygen. And you think, no, I think Lavoisier is the discoverer of oxygen. That's why the story is complicated. This announcement would make both Lavoisier and Priestley spin in their graves. Why? Because Lavoisier would say, no, I am the discoverer of oxygen. And Priestley would say, I discovered no such thing. Because he didn't call it oxygen. He said what he made was Deflogisticated air. Now, what on earth does that mean? Uh, this refers to this concept of phlogiston, which was really popular in 18th century chemistry. The basic idea is this what happens when something burns, like a piece of charcoal? Now, a flame comes out. Where was that flame before the thing was burning? So they hypothesized there is this substance called phlogiston. Um, which is uh, like the substance of flame, the principle of inflammability, they called it. So it was all existing in the charcoal in the hidden form. When you get combustion going, it separates out, comes out as flame and leaves the rest of it in the form of an ash. And they also figured out that the rusting of metals is the same kind of process as combustion, just slow, right? So metal is also full of this thing called phlogiston. And when the phlogiston slowly leaves the metal, it turns into what they call the calx, what we call a rust, the crumbly stuff, earthy stuff. And you might think, well, this is just all made up fairy tale, but not really because the, the phlogiston theory said, no, no, what, what, what we call phlogiston is real. Let, let us show you. We can take a calx, mix it up with something rich in phlogiston like charcoal, and heat it up together, uh, transferring the phlogiston from the charcoal to the calx and turning the calx back into the metal, reducing it, as we would say. And that's what happens in the process of smelting all the time. And then Joseph Priestley said, I will show you that in a clean form, not using something like charcoal, but a gas, a gas that's so full of phlogiston, which he called inflammable air, which we now call hydrogen, right? It's combustible, must be full of phlogiston. So he said, I'm gonna fill up a space um, containing a piece of calx with inflammable air, and I'm gonna heat it with a big lens. 
And hopefully the inflammable air will give its resistance to the calx, turn the calx into the metal, and that is precisely what happened. Amazing. And this water level rose, indicating that the inflammable air had been absorbed. So doing lots of experiments like this, Priestley also happened to do the same kind of thing in normal air with a mercury oxide. And now we say, aha, mercury, the red oxide of mercury is weird because when you heat it to a very high temperature, it just dissociates, giving off oxygen. Priestley thought, no, what happened is the surrounding air gave its phlogiston to the calx and made the phlogisticated air, which was amazing. He said a mouse could live longer in this new air than in normal air. And having seen that, he said, oh, I, I want to try breathing that too. So he breathed pure oxygen for the first time ever by a human being and said, oh, I felt wonderful. My lungs were light. And that's the beginning of oxygen therapy. And imagine how many people would have died without that in this COVID pandemic. Anyway, to finish the story, the most wonderful discovery Priestley thought he had made was not simply making oxygen, but the ecosystem. Right, because uh, I mentioned, right, he was doing these experiments, putting poor mice in, in little confined spaces, and he observed that they would die after a while. They'd suffocate to death, and they'd live longer in oxygen. But if he put into normal air, not only the mouse, but a little plant, this is a little mint plant, then the mouse lived much longer. And now we say, yes, the mouse will. Uh, breathe oxygen, emit carbon dioxide, the plant will take carbon dioxide in, may emit oxygen. This whole wonderful system goes around. So this little jar here is the representation of the entire earth and our ecosystem. And Priestley was so delighted by this discovery because his chemistry he saw was at the heart of the divine order of nature. I mentioned he was a minister, right? He thought, of course, God would have provided us with a way to live because without this circulation, we'd all just die. So that I think is a nice image of how chemistry is everywhere in nature and in human life. And um, we continue to investigate the wonderful intricacies of this chemical order of nature. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Dr. Zhang to tell you about today's chemistry. Yeah, thank you. That was so interesting. So if anyone has uh, questions for a doc uh, Professor uh, Chang, you're welcome to ask after the presentation. Um, uh, you can ask him about his stories or about the subject of history and philosophy of science, which is a, a subject that is uh, taken by students in second year uh, in the natural uh, NASCI course. Okay, so what uh, building on what Professor Chang has asked, how do we apply what uh, we know about chemistry now to solve the issues of today? And what I really want to do is build on some of the stories told by Professor Chang, in particular, uh, touching on electrochemistry. Uh, hopefully you can see this, do, do let me know if, if you can't see the presentation, because I can't see anyone at the moment, but essentially touching on electrochemistry and what is it, it is now um, it, compared to what it was before and what it can do for us. And we can really go way beyond just batteries and um, electrolysis. We can now really make chemicals and also build sensors. So I had initially intentioned for Dr. Svetlana to come. Jenny, uh, sorry yeah? to interrupt. Have, are, you, are you presenting something? Yes. Oh, so we can't see your, oh, we can't see your presentation, oh, sorry. Oh, you're telling me, sorry. I thought I had uh, shared it. Oh, okay, okay. So, now we have it. Now ah, we have it. Sorry, sorry. I must have transitioned to the wrong screen. So here we go again. Sorry again. Uh, so basically, we're going back to these big questions. And uh, essentially, this uh, we're going now from big picture to how we can use electric, um, chemistry to solve some of the, these problems about uh, our environment and reversing climate change. And like I said, I wanna to touch on modern uh, electrochemistry building on what Professor Chan has said. Uh, and really we wanna go beyond batteries uh, and corrosion studies and into modern technologies. Uh, 
So I really uh, initially intentioned for uh, Dr. Merkin Mitchell to come and present, but she has COVID unfortunately starting last night and she doesn't have a voice anymore. So I'm just gonna quickly go through her slides just to show you how batteries have now evolved throughout the ages. So this is uh, the initial cell that was shown by Professor Schall. You can see that it, batteries have evolved through many different forms since then. And in fact, now what is more, most commonly used is a lithium batteries, which we use in cars and your mobile phones. And that, has, that was awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2019. And here is what, uh, if you look inside of a lithium battery, this is what it would look like. It's very different to uh, what we're showing before. You can see now we have two different electrodes. They're comprised of lots of different composite materials. We have lots of graphitic materials on the anode. Um, cathode is made up of metal oxides, like uh, made up of cobalt, metal oxides in particular. And really the thing that is doing, or the component that's doing most of the chemistry now is the lithium. The lithium is providing with with how uh, we're storing the energy. And during discharge, so we're generating electricity, the lithium is actually migrating through some membranes to from one side, uh, one electrode to the other. And as it forms, as it, as it, uh, uh, as it, produces, uh, sorry, as it interacts with uh, the chemicals, it is then releasing um, and storing energy at the same time, and you can go backwards and forwards many times. So when we're designing better batteries, we really have to understand inorganic chemistry to design the better materials, as well as organic chemistry, because this is about the wet stuff that Professor Chow was talking about. Actually, this is very complicated, and how that wet stuff, so the, the solvent, uh, plays a huge role in the, uh, in the performance of the battery. So this is one component that is really deserving of attention using organic chemistry. And of course, we need to understand the physical components of everything, uh, and that's very much linked to current day electrochemistry. And coupled to all of that, we use lots of um, spectroscopic methods to characterize it. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip straight to some of the problems with current batteries. And you can see here, the current issues we're facing is really about the materials. You can see that lithium is depleting. And this is the, the price of lithium rising over the years. It's really becoming very expensive, as with cobalt, which is the other material that's used to make um, batteries. And so what um, battery research is really trying to do now is searching for materials that um, are much more abundant, that can help us to uh, still provide the same type of uh, chemistries to, to deliver batteries that can be very long lasting and uh, very energy dense. Um, very quickly, one of the major issues with designing batteries is also how uh, the chemistry interacts with the surface of the electrodes. You can see that um, uh, as the charges go back and forth, as the lithium go back and forth, and as it plates from both one side to the other, uh, lots of uneven plating can occur, and eventually that can form dendrites. And if these dendrites pierce through uh, the membranes, you get short circuiting, and that's when you get fires. And you probably heard in the news a lot about dangerous batteries exploding, etc. And that's uh, basically because of surface chemistry that is um, uneven. And so there's a lot of uh, incredible chemistry that's being uh, undertaken right now to research this particular problem. Now I will go past this. I just just say that. Um, Dr. Uh, um, oh, Sir Svetlana, who is in the Claire Gray group, she's doing lots of research into this particular area, looking at the surface chemistry, looking at earth abundant materials to make the batteries, just so that we can make longer lasting, sustainable batteries for the future. And you can see that really where it's all heading is we're trying to go towards um, sodium batteries with better interfaces so that we can, use, uh, we can make more sustainable batteries for the future. So these are a very active areas of research, uh, very diverse teams working on it. If you want more information, um, this is a current group that is working on it. Now, I want to work a look, look beyond batteries for a little bit because um, we actually can use uh, electrochemistry in very powerful ways. And actually electrochemistry won another Nobel Prize um, about 60 years ago uh, from this Czech scientist. And essentially what he's done is introduced an X 
extra electrode, a reference electrode into electrochemical setups, which allows us to have very precise control over one of the electrodes so that we can very precisely control redox chemistry occurring on one electrode. And these top of cells allows us to do um, chemical reactions in ways we couldn't before and study them in ways we couldn't before. And this is also, here is another modern uh, representation in the form of electrochemical chip. It's, it's the size of a penny. You can see these three electrodes. You can put a spot of blood onto it and you can do electrochemistry. And the type of things you can do, so you can see here, I won't explain the, the details, but essentially this is the one electrode we can control, the working electrode, and we can basically turn substrates that are redox active into products that we would like. So some of the substrates that would be really useful for solving our world's problem right now would be water, turning it into oxygen um, and hydrogen to make fuels and feedstock. We want to be able to utilize the, uh, the CO2 that we capture, hopefully we capture using other other technologies and turn it into uh, a recycler into making chemicals or other fuels that we can use and again uh, fertilizer we, we would just talk but we want to make it in a greener sustainable way and beyond making more chemicals we can detect redox chemistry in everyday um, uh, solvents so for example glucose in your blood so that we can monitor um, diseases and, and health levels or nitrate in soils to help us or help farmers better fertilize or not over fertilize so these are the types of things we're doing with electrochemistry uh, the main challenge now is designing catalysts. Now, why we need catalysts is because that substrates don't just give electrons up very easily to the electrodes. We need something to help along the reaction. Because in catalysis, even if the substrate, if the reaction is exothermic um, or endothermic, it doesn't matter, you know, what this, uh, whether it's exothermic or endothermic, whenever we want a reaction to occur, there's always going to be an activation barrier. So the kinetics is going to be a process where we need to break bonds before we form the bonds to release the energy. And to overcome this barrier, we need catalysts. The catalyst allows us to minimize the energy input before we uh, go on to uh, proceeding with our reaction pathways. And so just to give you more of an example, here's a Haber-Bosch process again. Now, this process, as mentioned, is incredibly important. Without it, we'll only be feeding 3 billion people on Earth instead of the 9 or so billion we will have. Now, this is the process right now. You can see we have to combine nitrogen with hydrogen and we don't just mix it. We have to really heat it up because you can see even though it's an exothermic reaction, there's a huge activation barrier. And that is because nitrogen is incredibly stable. It's got a triple bond. So we need to provide lots of heat, high pressure and iron catalyst. And it's only then that we can um, create with some, it's, it's only a 15% conversion efficiency. So it's not even that high. And we we have to cycle it quite a few times before we reach near 90 uh, percent efficiencies. Now this is obviously very energy intensive and it takes up about one to three percent of total energy, uh, global energy consumption. More than that though is this process where we have to source our hydrogen. At the moment the easiest and cheapest way is from steam reforming which is heating methane with water to release um, these, um, sub uh, these products. And that subsequently lead to the formation of CO2. And IEA estimates that 70% of CO2 um, emission is actually coming from this process, this process of producing hydrogen. So there's lots of problems in our nitrogen, uh, in our uh, ammonia production. So can we solve this using electrochemistry? This is something we're really trying to do. And it's again, what we're trying to do is make better catalysts because we can actually make um, hydrogen in ambient and mild conditions using protons <clears throat> if we have a good catalyst. So you can see that again, substrate to product. And what we really need is a catalyst um, that can potentially help the bond formation to occur so that we don't need to inject a lot of energy. And in fact, in nature, we have catalysts that can do that. It's a hydrogenase. Um, these are found in many types of micro uh, micro 
microorganisms. And inside this hydrogenase, which is an enzyme, there's an active site, and this is what the active site looks like. You can see that the iron and the pendant amine basically hold two protons really close together. And if this catalyst is close to, for example, an electron source, like an electrode, it, the electrons will feed in as they're holding the two hydrogens together, so you can form hydrogen really easily. And that's what scientists are doing at the moment. We're trying to mimic this active site or use the protein, but it's a bit unstable. But if we can make robust molecular catalysts that can do similar things, then we can make hydrogen in a really sustainable way. So this is a very active area of research right now. Um, and that's where we want to be, basically traversing that mountain there. And same with ammonia, we should be able to do the same thing if we can find a good catalyst. And again, from nature, we have inspiration, nitrogenase, um, that has an active site that um, at the moment people are trying to understand how it works. But again, it can hold um, nitrogen in a way together with some protons to be able to form uh, ammonia in ambient and mild conditions. And so again, we're trying trying to mimic this using molecular catalysts. So these are type of research that's undergoing. It's why chemistry is really important. Um, last two minutes, I'm just going to quickly say how this also translates to a very important area, which is biosensing. So diabetes, a lot of people have it and many more will in the next decade or so. However, it's becoming a very manageable disease because of electrochemistry. Okay, so glucose sensors, which were uh, invented around 50 years ago, essentially utilizes electrochemistry. Again, we have a catalyst that is able to interact with electro through electron shuttle. Glucose are basically oxidized by the, the enzyme and, and very selectively so, so that we can correlate the, we can count the number of electrons and correlate that directly to the amount of uh, glucose that's in your blood. And using something very simple, so this is a simple electrochemical a technique called chronoamperometry, we can detect different levels of glucose. So using this, we're making biosensors to help you manage your diseases. And of course, not just diseases, we, can, we need to use this for different contexts. So for nitrate sensing. Now, after we introduce ammonia into our in our soil, it can be converted into nitrates, which then can, can cycle back into the atmosphere. Now we tend to basically, or farmers tend to over or uh, under fertilize and both lead to poor outcomes. Okay, this is why we need sensing so that we can understand how much we're fertilizing. Usually we over fertilize more than under fertilize. This is problematic because of runoff, which then lead to algae blooms, toxics, um, which releases toxins in the environment. And also nitrates uh, and nitrous oxides, they, they are 300 times more potent in the air than um, CO2 is. So this is why we need to find ways of helping um, farmers to monitor how much they're fertilizing. So this is another area of research, developing nitrate sensors, and this is really exciting as it's, it's uh, being commercialized at the moment. Um, but more than that, we need to develop other types of sensors, for example, for herbicides and pesticides. And this is very current research. Um, these are also bad, obviously, for the environment. So photosynthesis today, so uh, Professor Chang, uh, he talked about how photosynthesis was, you know, initially kind of discovered in, in terms of its reaction of its oxygen producing um, reaction. Nowadays, we actually understand it to a much more uh, finer detail. We now can uh, see into the parts of photosynthesis of the photosynthetic organisms that produce the oxygen and does all the chemistry. We can zoom in, these are the organelles. We know exactly how the electrons are moving, where what chemicals are being used, and we even can look into a molecular scale what photosynthesis look like uh, in terms of uh, the proteins that are doing all the, the chemistry. And what is ex really exciting is that not we can understand this to such a fine detail. We know how electrons move through the enzyme. So I've just very quickly whizzed through this. Um, but essentially, all you need to understand is that there is a incredible enzyme called photosystem 2 that do the, the water oxidation to produce the oxygen. The electrons are extracted, can go through a chain, and basically we can interface this with an electrode now to harness those electrons to do useful chemistries, to make fuels, etc. But also um, we can use this as a sensor because of the fact that these pockets, are, um, that's what the herbicides are targeting. That's how herbicides work. They target 
with this enzyme, they block it. And if you block it, you don't have electron transfer. We can sense this using electric chemical platform. And again, we can develop novel and new sensors based on this type of technology. So we have basically, what I'm trying to show you is that we've come a full circle and we have really come a long way since um, the first steps of, of chemistry. Uh, so that was a whiz through um, chemistry through the ages and hopefully that helped us to understand and answer some of your questions. I try to tackle each of your individual questions through some of my explanations, but maybe I missed one or two, but maybe we have time to ask that later. Um, so in the afternoon, we will talk about uh, medicine and new materials, but for now, I think I'll just uh, leave it and see if we have any time for, for questions. I'll, I'll, I'll now pass it on back to James. We should all say thank you to Jenny there for an incredibly high paced presentation. <laughs> that was some serious, serious coverage of um, some chemistry there. Um, we were rec we're recording everything. So, you know, you can go through at different points um, and just stop and have a look at anything that you are particularly um, interested. Um, so Ellie asks um, about uh, lithium batteries, I would guess. So do you think developing methods of lithium recycling is worthwhile or should we fake focus on developing other types of battery? I think, okay, so Svetlana is not here, but I think she would say that we need both, you know, we can't just have one thing. So absolutely very good point, Ellie, we need ways of recycling it. That's a really active way, uh, uh, area of research, but also we need alternatives as well, because um, uh, the other, we want to move away from lithium because also lithium won't allow us to have as much charging capacity. We want to have higher cap charging capacity. And so that's why if we move on to different types of elements, it might give us that as well. So both would be great. Um, I'm not sure who this is from, but they say, uh, to what extent do catalysts play a role in chemistry and what factors are considered when selecting catalysts? Catalysts are incredibly important. So I just, um, I hope I explained uh, to you what they do. Essentially, they help you overcome activation barriers. So you can do, uh, you can get to products more efficiently without as much of an input of energy. Uh, and so if we want to make anything useful, we need catalysts to help us minimize the energy input that is needed. And so I think the second part of that, that question was how do we make a good catalyst? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's, it's a really great question, how we design catalysts. Um, fundamentally what we typically do is look at nature and see if nature's already done it. And if they've done it, then we look at how they've done it. Uh, so basically what I've shown before, and then we try to imitate it. Um, sometimes we can, uh, by chance, see that, oh, some materials give really nice catalytic activity, but we don't know how it, it, it does it, and then we have to go back and, and characterize it. Um, but what makes a really good catalyst is the ability for it to selectively handle substrates and then uh, manipulate the bonds and so that it allows uh, the electrons to move around in a way to form new bonds in a very easy manner. And so that's why proteins and enzymes are so important because they have these um, channels that allow selectively for, uh, for substrates to come in. And then in the pocket where the active site is, the environment is dangling parts that hold still certain bits of the substrate as the substrate active site is, is acting on it and so all of that helps the transformation to occur much more efficiently and if we can replicate that synthetically that would be the holy grail um this one might be um for hasak uh, what is the philosophical direction of pharmacy <laughs> yes i'm not sure if i can really answer that but um i mean there there is something we should be thinking about which is you know this whole idea of the magic bullet which um on which so much hope had rested and now we're realizing you know disease and health is a much more complicated business even if you have the effective chemical uh, remedies you need to have the social system to deliver it you need to have equality and justice um, in the whole society. So people get the right treatment for the right conditions. And you also need to do more research in the right areas, which has priority. You know, we talk about how malaria, for example, is not getting enough research because uh, we are 
<laughs> spending our time, energy, and talent on things like Viagra. Um, so there are philosophical questions to consider in pharmacy uh, about where the research should go and how the products of research should be deployed. Great. Right. Um, we've got a question from Thomas here, which is, where would you place electrochemistry in importance in chemistry in general? I mean, for me, I'm an electrochemist, so I'm going to put it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. I don't, maybe, maybe Professor Chan will have a better perspective, though. <laughs> um, uh, Harry asks, um, is hydrogen power better for the future than uh, using batteries? Um, it, it's different. It's more dense. And also hydrogen, as you saw, is a feedstock, so it can be used for other things. So uh, what we need is a, it's a diversity. You know, we need diversity in terms of strategies. We can't just rely on one because if one doesn't work or one some, something runs out, then we have nothing. So we need a whole range of strategies. So it's not really better. It's just different. Um, and we need a whole range of different strategies. Mm. Um, we've got a lot of questions sort of around um, sustainability, um, environmental concerns, and I just wondered, I'm going to sort of smush them all into one question, if that's okay, everyone, I apologise if I get someone's questions a bit wrong, um, but in your talk, you definitely were, it felt like you were talking a lot about how chemistry can help us fix existing problems, so we do something as a society that is bad practice environmentally. So here's how chemistry can mitigate that effect. Is there anything that's currently happening at chemistry at the moment, which is sort of almost being a bit more proactive? So helping us not do the bad thing in the first place, if that makes sense. Well, currently, yes. Yeah. So that's what the sensing is all about, you know, so we can detect what we're doing. So we mitigate um, over fertilizing and having a pollution and an over pesticide, over use of pesticides, etc. Sensing is really important. And same thing with a glucose sensor It's to prevent you from, um, you know, overdosing on sugar, uh, glucose, so that you won't go into, um, you won't, run into problems if you have diabetes. So it's all about prevention. Yeah. So developing the tools for prevention is equally important. 